title of our episode is How Colleges Can Best Support uh, Prospective Students and Parents. Mike, why are we doing today's episode? Oh, well, it's that time of year. Everyone starts thinking about enrollment management. We saw the, uh, I don't know how your institution feels about the U.S. News and World Report rankings, but, you know, they just came out. Uh, NACAX around the corner. In fact, we'll be there, booth 818, 820. So it's a good time of year to talk enrollment management. And Frankly, we have two fantastic guests with us today that are experts in identifying barriers in the admissions process and eliminating them or helping students and parents navigate them. Yes, you are also a part of the show. If at any point in time you have questions, populate that chat. Shout out your school to begin with. We love that. Turn your cameras on if you want. Show us your faces so our guests have an audience to speak with. We love it when you do that. Uh, you don't have to if you're eating lunch or something like that, but it's definitely a cool part of the conversation when you show us your beautiful higher ed faces out there. Thank you for that. Love seeing all these folks out there today. Awesome. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. If you want to come on and ask a question to one of our two guests that we are seconds away from introducing, um, <laughs> please just let Lexi know in the chat and we'll set that up and make it happen. Today's episode, of course, brought to you by Mongoose, makers of Cadence, Higher Ed's premier engagement platform. Mike, who are we speaking with today? Yes, from Ologi, we have Dave Kiebelds. Um, and from Campus Sonar, the CEO and founder, Dr. Liz Gross. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dave, why don't you introduce yourself first? Tell us, you know, what brought you here. Hi, thanks so much for having me and for the quick intro. So my name is Day. Uh, I have been working in marketing for about 15 years and specifically higher education for 12 of those years. Um, I've had every possible role you can think of in enrollment. I've been a road warrior, a letter writer, a presenter, a campus tour guide, an event planner, a CRM implementer, student system, you know, programmer. I've, I've done it all in enrollment uh, across North America. So I've worked in, at institutions both in uh, the United States and in Canada. Um, a few months ago, I joined Ology as a strategy director. I focus primarily on enrollment strategies, um, sub-brand messaging for enrollment purposes, but I do also have a background in uh, fundraising and specifically annual funds. So I'm super excited to be here to talk about this particular topic today because I really care about it personally as a first-generation Hispanic immigrant um, college student that failed to navigate the system the first time. So recently I've, I've gotten into admissions communications, making it clear to understand and supporting families through the process. Dave's story is super interesting. Yes. I'm sure we'll hear more about it as we go. Dr. Gross, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Please tell uh, the, our audience what we can expect from you. Day, I didn't know we were gonna add up our years and have to <laughs> talk about how long we've been doing this. Uh, I believe I have been working professionally in higher education for 18 years now, uh, started actually in an association and then uh, spent time on campus in marketing roles that, that were in student affairs, housing, kind of playing around with enrollment, supporting them through orientation, and then also marketing communication director at a community college in the great state of Wisconsin. I see we have at least one other Wisconsinite in the chat. Uh, and then joined the higher ed adjacent space and started focusing more on social media specifically. I did social media strategy for a student loan servicer for a while. And then for the last five years have been at the helm of Campus Sonar, an expert advisory firm that uses social intelligence through social listening research to understand and analyze the conversations about and from colleges and universities and the topics that are of importance to them. Uh, this has been fascinating for me because those five years have coincided with a lot of changes in how students are looking um, for information about college, how they're trusting each other for information about college, where they're talking about it, and how campuses are using digital spaces to market to students. So I've largely been looking at this from understanding how students are talking about the process, as well as what colleges are doing with that information. Uh, and I am so excited to spend the next hour with these folks, particularly Day, because I learned so much from her every single time we chat. So it's been years since we've been, the been in the same space physically. So this Zoom room is gonna have to do it. Great for guess. now. 
Yes, <laughs> a, a great guest rounds out their intro by getting right back into the conversation and talking about the topic at hand, which is um, supporting prospective students and their parents, Mike. Yes. Yes. So let's start at the beginning. I yeah. guess the best place to start, I believe, at the beginning. Um, so a lot of priorities, a lot going on for students and their family and uh, their guardians when they start to um, begin the college search. So um, where do you see colleges? Um, like, uh, I guess, what's the best way to start? Um, opportunities, missed opportunities, uh, what schools are doing right and what they're doing wrong. Um, I guess let's just start right at the beginning. Hey, Dave, we should have co uh, we should have coordinated because I bet that we could jinx ourselves on where anyone should start with anything. Yeah, so I'm going to let you go first and then I'll just agree and look really smart because <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, when I think about any conversation of like, where should you start? I don't care if we're talking about enrollment marketing, connecting with students, brand marketing, whatever it is, you know, where you should start is knowing your goals and your, your actual goals as they relate to not just your department um, or a target number that you have to reach, but your institution and how that plays into it. Uh, along with that, your target audiences and specific to enrollment. I, I'm going to use the S word right away at the beginning of this talk and say sales. Uh, I think you have to think about your unique selling proposition for your institution because uh, thinking about all the barriers and missed opportunities, um, the missed opportunity is being different uh, and not looking exactly the same as every other institution out there that is battling for students. So I've got a lot of other thoughts in this area, but uh, I want to hear what Day has to say first, but you'll never ask me where to start and have me not answer with know your goals before diving into the what you're going to do with it. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, how do you know where you're going, right? Um, one of the interesting things about transitioning from working for universities from within and now working at an agency that works with many universities in the country is how um, actually no one is that unique. <laughs> um, so we get to look at the messaging across institutions, across the country, across all sorts of variables. And, you know, the foundation is kind of the same. Like you're going to get a degree, you're going to have a great experience, you're going to get experiential learning. Um, there's going to be support, et cetera. What is your flavor of that is part of where you need to start. Um, so to Lissa's point, what is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish in terms of, you know, enrollment, student engagement, retention, graduation? And then how do you approach that at your institution is a lot more valuable today, today than what are you doing? Because the what is very similar across institutions. So like, what's, you know, are you funny? What are your support? Like, do people access them differently? Does it feel different? Like, do you focus on ambience? Like I'm talking about very minute details, but really that's where the differentiation is now because a lot of the services are actually the same across the board, which matters a lot in enrollment because they're, you're being compared across the board. Um, but if you're in like a student engagement, um, student experience, then you get to really dive deep into your own identity. I will say though, second to goals, I'm sorry, I'm going, I'm going with this question. Go for it. Yeah. Second to goals, once you have your goals, the next really important thing is who's your audience. And uh, you can't do any message and you can't do any of that other stuff without answering those two questions really clearly. Well, yeah, they and Liz brought up great points about um, kind of treating it as sales and mm -hmm. thinking about the journey that your um, uh, prospective student, i.e. customer, is going through. And I think they kind of hinted on that. You're not unique. But if you're trying to set up your institution to be the institution that a prospective student finds, you better find something you need to talk about um, in order to connect with that student. So what do you do? I, I think, Mike, maybe thinking about it through the eyes of uh, the, the person searching for your institution, maybe. Sure. Okay, so yeah. how does that search begin? How is it evolving? Like, uh, uh, should we talk about the search here? What, well, why don't we talk about the evolution? Okay, so, let's talk about the evolution. Um, can, I, can I jump in before you even go there? Because your sure. point of how does that search begin? Yeah. I think the other thing we have to think about in terms of where do institutions start is, particularly for those, those of you, us, who've been at this a while, um, really making sure that we're taking stock of the societal context that we're operating in now. Mm -hmm. And that the, the concept that 
a student who is graduating from college or an adult who is considering a career trans or is graduating from high school or an adult who is considering a career transition might be starting with the question, should I go to college? Not where should I go to college? The value of a college degree has been questioned more in the last five years than it ever was when Day and I started working in this industry. So I think you also have to consider like, is that a part of the question you need to answer for your audience? Or are you working with the students who know that that is the path and know that they want to go on. I think there's some early journey stuff you could be considering um, mm -hmm. that might make you a bit unique. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Dave, what did you think? I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a short, this is going to be a short live presentation. Just to have, uh... No, no, I, I agree. And I'll, uh, you kind of said, you just said it very succinctly, the early, early journey, early search. Um, and I think that's where that messaging is really powerful. Like what, what is college? What is, what are path, like what pathways do you have? What does it look like? What could it look like? There's many different providers out there nowadays too, where you can earn uh, college credit for some courses before you even actually enroll in a college, right? So um, if you're thinking about building communication journeys for so sophomores, juniors, like maybe that's what you talk about. It's the value of getting a um, higher education or, you know, bachelor's degree, period. And then you talk about your institution. So Day, when, um, and, and I will say this before I ask the question, not every institution is the same, uh, particularly there'll be some community colleges that might be in our audience that were um, competing with other schools and finding um, folks to fill the seats aren't necessarily, that's not their biggest problem. It's helping the students who have found their institution through that mm -hmm. process, through the finish line and answering questions. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're here and you have specific questions that might not like be answered because we can't cover all the schools with one blanket. So just make sure if you have questions for our guests, um, uh, personalize it to your institution. We want to dive into it. We want you to come away with something that helps you. Um, but back to what I was saying, um, if you are a school that has schools in the Wisconsin area that you're competing with or schools in the Michigan area or um, Milwaukee or wherever um, you're competing, uh, should the mindset be a little different? Because I've heard, Day, um, you talk about this in some other content I've seen where um, uh, you're not thinking about the student search, you're thinking about the institution maybe searching for the student and being proactive. Do you have thoughts on the proactiveness of um, how admissions could or should be? Uh, and that's a really fantastic question. I, I think we're seeing a lot more proactive enrollment, proactive recruitment, because institutions want to change the composition of their incoming class. And in order to change the composition of your class, specifically to reach historically underrepresented groups and you know, historically excluded groups, um, you, you, the system isn't working for them. So we have to create a new system. We have to go out and find them. We have to create different pathways for them. They might not even know to look. Um, I mean, I, I want to get a little bit into the barriers and, and what those look like. Um, but to answer the proactive question, yes, I am seeing some differences. Um, it is not enough to attend a college fair and just hope for the best that people are going to show up and, and then like stay in your funnel and, you know, get an offer and accept. Uh, I think institutions start with that clear goal, like Liz said earlier, it, who are you trying to reach and then create specific um, like tactics to go out where they are to reach them there. And this is where Dr. Gross will say, I agree with everything that Kay said. See that. <laughs> <laughs> if I may ask, there's more momentum than ever for this idea of flipping the admissions process and essentially allowing institutions to, for lack of a better term, bid on students. Is that a thing? Do you think it's going to catch on? I think there's a lot of barriers, but I'd be curious to hear what you two think. It's been a while since I talked about that. Uh, so I uh, don't have like super recent opinions on it because when you said the trend of flipping it, uh, my head went somewhere else. Um, well, tell us, tell yeah, us, tell yeah, us where. Yeah, where. so I, because when I started in higher ed, I did not start in admissions and I started in more of a, a marketing role. The 
the concept of student search baffled me for years <laughs> and I didn't understand what it meant because if you are a, um, a, a pri primarily a marketer, right? Search means other things. It means organic search. It means SEO. It means search engine marketing means all the sorts of things. Uh, the, the concept to me that we were buying swaths of names to spray and pray formulaic messaging to and calling it a search as an outsider at the time just blew my mind. And when, so when I think about flipping it, I think about how can enrollment marketers consider the principles of inbound marketing in their content strategy and how they set up their comm flows uh, so that they are not just sending messages and invitations and propositions to students, but they are in the spaces where the students will be when they are searching for answers to their questions or information about college or whatever that might be. And I don't think the, the perfect way is just one or just the other, but when I think about flipping student search, um, that is what I think about. I am not quite in that futuristic realm of thinking about colleges bidding on students, although I know there are some people that are very hyped about that uh, I'm not going to put myself in that bucket just yet. Right. Um, are there institutions, uh, for example, at Georgia Tech and uh, is it Rick Clark, I believe, come to mind? Is that where you're thinking, like basically guiding <clears throat> students using content through the process? And ideally, they apply to Georgia Tech and get accepted and become members of the Rambling Rec. But if they don't, we're still informing the the uh, the audience, right? Is that the, the concept? Yeah, and, and his state peer institution, uh, EGA, does very similar transparent work, but um, that's one way to do it. I, I think that um, if we talk more about how search has evolved and, and barriers and ideas for where folks are going to go, um, I know Day and I are going to have some other ideas of ways to, <laughs> to be where students are and answer those questions in the moment in a variety of different ways. Um, wow, a lot of places to jump off there. Um, I grabbed this quote when reading um, some campus sonar stuff that all admissions is uh, admissions, all content is admissions content. And I wanted to write it down. Yeah. And as a writer, I have to tell you, I was incredibly angry at this because it's, You've heard this in different forms, but it's so succinctly put an expert that I hate who wrote it. It was, it may have been Dr. Liz, uh, it may have been one of her colleagues, but um, that person um, just put it right. And they had it just in a sentence. It would, this should be like the, this should be, the, the, it should be all content as admissionscontent.com. Um, but it was just a line in a paragraph that I like. Yeah. So I love that line. And it's so true. Um, like that uh, alumni, everything about your college is what draws students to your college. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I wrote it in chalk. There you go. I have no idea. I should have painted it. So it's more permanent. It'll stain probably a little. <laughs> It's right. a campus like sonar I swag idea right here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're making yeah. money. We're making money. We're making money. <laughs> Mike, segue because I've embarrassed myself. That's all right. So we've we've used the term barriers. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are some of those hidden barriers in the process, and how can institutions uh, check against them? Uh, I can go first, Liz. So there are there are many barriers, and when we say the word barrier, what do most of us think about? Money. I went probably. financial aid. Yeah. I yeah. Thought yes. That big money. Risk. Yes. And we stay there. Like it's a big one. It's a really big, important one. And it definitely hurts with um, equity and, and diversity and inclusion. And it's it shouldn't be an ignored barrier. However, because we focus so much on that one, what I have experienced um, in my career is that it's the go to to explain maybe why. Uh, our classes are not as diverse as we want them to be, or, you know, it explains why maybe students are not applying from the groups we want. And uh, it feels kind of lazy to me, right? So I've spent the past three, four years thinking about other types of barriers that are just as effective at keeping people out of institutions. And uh, there's basically two that, that I've kind of just hung my hat on and been talking about for the past year or so. One is um, the like actual digital equity divide, like the access to devices, internet, broadband connection, uh, a computer that is just yours, 
And uh, there's a very recent study that just came out by, um, actually, no, this is not so, re like Pew, I think it's Pew Research. Like they have a bunch of stats on their website um, that talk about this access and how different it is, um, especially when you look across socioeconomic variables and racial ethnicity variables. So what are we saying? We're saying that we're excluding about 30 to 40% of the population period by just making some things available on a computer. That every beautiful, amazing uh, you know, website with videos that we make, it's amazing. It's gonna hit you know, the 80%, but that 20% that we're focusing on when we're trying to you know, really enhance our DEI efforts, like they're not even, they're, like they're not even getting to this content. They can't open it, right? So this is a huge thing that I've seen marketers um, kind of ignore, especially as technology technology develops and we think we got to be flashier and we think we got to be cooler and we're forgetting like, you know, hey, hmm, there's like 30% of people that are not going to be able to watch this video. And one of the most interesting stats here for me is like, there's, there's a strong correlation between, um, you know, access to multiple devices, access to computer, access to fast internet at your home. If you're a white family with an income of over $100,000 per year, and there's multiple generations of college going people in your family versus access to only one device. That's probably a smartphone for families that are of color or black or indigenous and uh, immigrant families that maybe don't speak English as the first language and um, make under $30,000 a year. So in particular, when I think about DEI and recruitment, I'm like, okay, well, what are we doing to reach the people that don't even have the tools to reach us? That's one, it's the digital actual access. The other one that I really care about is language. Um, so I don't know about you all, but in my experience, every institution I've worked at, um, there's almost a little bit of pride about how complicated admissions language is. Almost like when you ask admission counselors, it's like, oh my God, I know it's so complicated. Like I've been doing it for 20 years and that's why I get it. Onboarding for this role takes three years, right? Like it's, it's a source of pride, but what they don't recognize is that that same, like we're expecting people that are not in this profession to understand that in the span of six months. Mm. And then you add layers, right? You have the layers, the, um, I don't have the family support to help me through this. I don't have the time. I have a part-time job. I don't speak the language, et cetera. Um, that effectively makes this content completely inaccessible for these families. And this one's the one that um, I like to talk about cognitive load. Um, this is a concept by Nielsen Norman group. And uh, I think it's, I don't know, I think this might be from like 2013 or 2003 even. <laughs> it's, it's an established concept that basically says um, our brains are like computers. And uh, so there's limited capacity, right? And the more information you put in there, um, you know, starts to heat up and it takes you a little bit longer to understand things. Maybe your performance suffers a little bit, like you do things slow, like more slowly. Maybe you don't um, quite get details or news, like nuance. And sometimes you even abandon the task. So how many students are we not are we not even seeing apply because they open up this website and they're like, oh my God, I speak English, but I don't understand this. That's language. So um, we, need to, we need to understand that these are barriers completely within our control. We can write more simply. We can simplify the process. But when we ask ourselves why, like why are we not seeing you know, equity in our application pool, we go to scholarships or financial aid as the answer. So these two, you know, access to devices, access to internet, and really simple, accessible spoken language are two big things anyone can do right now to make sure students are, you know, we're removing barriers that are very much there. I build Liz, on that with two more things, Dave. Yes, yeah. Liz, I was yeah. going to offer up your uh, opportunity to. Yeah, respond. you almost said it, and I was like, oh, she's going to go there too. But no, I'll go there. Um, the application process, right, can be entirely complicated, contribute to cognitive overload. For some people, it's the application itself that is. Mm -hmm. the it's too much, it's too complicated, mm -hmm. it, it may not be accessible. 
And I am super intrigued by the handful of institutions that are trialing this idea of drive up or guaranteed admissions because mm -hmm. they know they are not trying to be an overly selective institution. Their mission is access. So why spend all that time having, an, having a prospective student throw out a bunch of information that is going to result in an acceptance nine times out of 10, right? So that I think is super interesting. Like is the application a barrier and do you have some sway there to make that change? And then the other I think is, is a concept of, of students' perception of whether or not they will have a sense of belonging or personal safety, both physical and psychological on campus. Every single student is trying to ask the question of, will I belong here? And for students of color, LGBTQ students, disabled students, and even more, I am seeing very, very regularly neurodiverse students, they want to know, will there be students like them and or services and programs designed with them at the center rather than them as an afterthought at the institution? And for a lot of that information, students have to go through unofficial channels to find it out. They're not going to get that information up front. And hmm. we, we've actually covered belonging um, uh, in past episodes just very recently. Um, so it's a topic that Mike and I care very much about. Um, and is it as simple as, um, as some of our past guests have said, uh, listening, like knowing that your institution has these barriers that you might not even know about, um, listening to students, um, auditing your processes, auditing your own application? Is, is, is it just as simple a day as just um, listening? But uh, what are some fixes that some of our guests here, um, I guess, suggestions that you would have? So definitely listening. And that, that goes hand in hand uh, with knowing who your audience is, what their needs are, what they're trying to accomplish, and then kind of creating content and, and processes to support that, not the other way around. Um, but in, in terms of other advice, and this might get into like, it might make this conversation evolve a little bit. It's also um, letting your institution speak for itself in many ways. So I have found um, when institutions take an approach that's highly curated and you know only whatever central office can produce this type of content and share it, that uh, there's, there's a lot of gaps missing, right? Because we can only write for the majority. We can write for the 80%. But when there are structures in place where students can talk to students uh, or students can talk to future students and faculty members can talk to future students, and it's okay for an academic advisor to consult with a future student, um, you know, this is, this is the actual, like the real life stuff that um, can reach those kind of nooks and crannies of content that we're missing when, when it's just this highly produced central thing. And of course, the best channel to do that is social in many ways, which I know we, we do eventually wanna talk about today. Um, but my advice in general is to keep it simple. It's, it's not complicated to simplify things. I know it, I guess it is, it could be complicated to simplify things, but um, start with what you can do. I'm not going to name names of institutions, but I've worked at a, a few admissions offices and I know other institutions have similar things where we called them red flags, but where there were applicants or sorry, prospective students in the process who applied and because their godmother was Diana Ross or something, you know, they got a little extra grace, a little extra treatment. And it always bugged me that we couldn't just do that for everybody, you know? Is there, mm -hmm. is that possible though? Like, is it possible to scale out processes so everyone has an extremely personalized, well curated um, experience that matters to them? Or do we have to make choices? society or admissions? Like that's more admissions, admissions yeah. but we could, we could talk society probably too. We only have an hour. Right. <laughs> uh, the question of scale is what keeps a lot of admission offices, you know, doing what they're doing and, and not, changing the, the approach, right? Imagine like you get 70,000 applications and you're only gonna admit 3000 students. Like, how do you do it? And so there's two things here that I think are, one is more futuristic than the other. 
The first one is essentially what we were talking about before. Hey, can we do admissions differently? Like, what are we even measuring here? Is what we're measuring actually predictive of anything? Like, like let's do something else that's easier. <laughs> that, you know, we can see the character of a person, but eh, who cares what their grade was in, you know, grade 10 chemistry. Right. Um, so that's one. But the other, um, I think, is it's the same point I just made. Like, you maybe you, admissions office, you don't have to do it all. Like, maybe you can outsource or crowdsource um, some of this uh, to your community. And, like, one very formalized example of this is when alumni make admission recommendations, right? Um, but, you know, what could we do like that that is a little bit more organic? Dr. Gross, if you had anything to add, I would give you the opportunity to do so now. Um, I did have letting a Dave's comments stand on her own. <laughs> okay, no, that's great. That's that that's that's just polishing everything up. That's great. So um, it could be uh, we would talked about um, kind of fixing the barriers or trying to help students pass those barriers. You had mentioned social media. You can accomplish a lot through social media in helping students through the barriers. And I know that um, uh, there could be examples of that kind of using social media um, to help students through that process. And that kind of does both things at once. Yeah, I mean, there's, so unsurprising, Liz is gonna talk about social listening for a minute um, <laughs> and something. Um, I think that when, when I think about social and the admissions process, uh, I think about two things that Day has hit on, but maybe we can dive into more depth uh, at this point. One, I think about peer influence and how so much of that prospective student journey is happening in peer-to-peer -peer spaces rather than mm -hmm. like gathering information from other institutions. Um, and I know uh, Day's actually spoken with a colleague of mine about this, so I'm pretty confident that we could uh, be in agreement that looking at, at and understanding those conversations, not necessarily interjecting yourself into all of them, but understanding them, what's happening, where questions are being asked, is your roadmap for the barriers that exist, the questions that are unanswered, the content that should be answered on your website, in your recruitment emails, in your conversations, your presentations, when you go out on the road, like that's what's out there for students. Um, but too often I see, when when admissions offices like we have to be on social the thing they're thinking about is i need to create content i need to publish content i need to have the best content i need to go viral i need more followers i need an amazing engagement rate but a lot of those things can happen and not correlate to actually moving students through the admissions process or getting them involved so I, when i think about like listening in relation to production on social um I think about like a 75, 25 split. Like listening is gonna, listening 75% of the time is gonna give you time to find, amplify and partner with students and alumni who are already guiding the conversation from, from a, a place of peer influence. And my Slack is blowing up for some reason. Um, and production can then be focused on engagement, which often, gets put to, down to the wayside, but actual one-to-one -one conversations with individuals, and then high-value evergreen content. If you're going to put your time into social, put your time into something that is going to adequately represent the experience at your institution or answer a top question or whatever that would be, that will be just as valuable today as it is in six months versus having a time span of four days to promote your visit day or whatever that might be. Um, but but there's they know so much more about some of these like newer semi-private areas on social where you can also have a huge impact if you're willing to take some risks. So I'm gonna shut up and mute my slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get I'll get specific. So um I think there's this is kind of something people have been saying, and there was a recent report from Unibuddy that has this statistic in it. Um basically your your website is still going to be the number one thing like you would let's not forget that we're not going to talk about it too too much today other than please write simple language on your website but social media is like the next um the next biggest place where students are going for information and uh i don't know if you've all heard this but like 
Gen Z apparently uses like TikTok and YouTube instead of Google to search for things now, right? Um, and it is not necessarily on you to be the person there producing the content that answers whatever those questions are. I think that's what, what we're trying to say here. Leverage the power of your community and the students on campus and the faculty members that like social media to generate some of this content with you. Um, I like strongly believe in peer to peer for all stages of the funnel. But uh, more than any other stage uh, in that kind of evaluation conversion phase, because the questions that students have at that point and, and families to accept this offer of admission, they're not, they're not, hey, do you have my program? What's my financial aid package anymore? Right? Like those have been answered with the offer of admission. They are a lot more, am I going to belong? How do I do this? What does my first year look like? Are my profs nice? Like, do I need a computer? Do I need an iPad? What type of shoes do I wear? Like it's these very specific real life questions that there's no way we have the bandwidth to address at that very personal level. But you have 40,000 students on your campus or you know, 5,000 students on your campus. They can answer these questions. So I like to use social as the platform to enable those interactions to happen um, between current students and prospective students. Uh, and there are ways to do that with like their uh, control, some control from the institution. But there are also ways to do that that are completely anonymous. Um, so I'm a fan of Reddit in particular. Um, Reddit can be really powerful if you already have a community on Reddit or students are asking about Reddit or about you on Reddit. Um, it's really hard to build a Reddit community from scratch though, but you should know if you have a Reddit community. And if you do, then you best believe there are people asking questions there, like from, um, you know, is this a good school to, oh my God, I got this email, what does it mean? So social is um, the place where they're going so that they can remove the barriers uh, for themselves and or fill in the gaps that we are not filling with like the content that we produce. And that's okay. So one of the cool things that I've like, I've wanted to try or I've tried um, in terms of enrollment strategy is to, you know, train up your student ambassadors to answer those questions. Why not, you know, answer the Reddit questions or um, have a lot of ask me anything type series on your Instagram and TikTok and Reddit. And um, for some of us, that's like, that's terrifying. Oh my God, what if they say something? They might, but also it's social. So you can see what they're saying. It's a little bit scarier when you let students loose on campus with families on a campus tour and you have no idea what they're saying. And yet we're totally okay and we let that happen, right? Here there's monitoring. So um, trust that, trust them. Like they, they want their institution to succeed. Uh, and really think of social not as a, as Bliss said, not as a, a place where you just kind of publish content, which is where our head goes, but think of social as the table where people are sitting around it and talking to each other. And that means let go. But then there's great results that come from that. So uh, to summarize that, um, as content creators, um, one of the biggest problems with content creation is knowing what to create. Like, what do I do? I have to do a social post today. No one cares that it's Arbor Day. Um, so find what questions are being asked by students. Yeah. Look at these channels. Uh, um, Reddit was mentioned, uh, your, um, TikTok. your TikToks, your YouTubes, find out what the questions are. And then when you find out what problems students are having, create your content from that, answer those questions. You don't even have to include, you know, you know um, where you're sourcing those questions from, just get that content out there so it's easy to find. Speaking of questions, we've had some roll in and it's our first opportunity to bring uh, Lexi Croisdale into the conversation who we've missed. So Lexi, we have questions. Lexi has a new background as well. Yeah, everyone. she's in our producer room. We need, look at the pennants. We need more pennants around yes. Lexi. So <laughs> send in your swag. We'll send some back. Yeah, happy to be on camera with you all. Usually I just have my little paw print floating around. Um, before I dive into your questions, I actually have my own question um, because I came from the world of higher ed social media, running it for a college within a large inst institution. So I'm just kind of curious for both of your thoughts Day and Liz, like in my experience, I managed the social for a college. Then there was the university level college like account. Then there was so many other colleges and then their admissions teams and their housing things that had social media. So when you're listening on social, like where do you find that balance when there's a lot of noise going on around campus and on social specifically? 
I am super spoiled uh, because the setup that Campus Sonar offers to our clients is to pull all that together in one space, it, along with the Reddit conversation that's happening without you, the YouTube conversation that's happening without you. Um, so if you're trying to listen one off here and there on what truly, to your point, is well over 100 accounts for most institutions, large institutions, you might be pushing four digits, which is terrifying. Uh, that That's impossible. It's frankly impossible. I believe a systemic approach to, to social listening is required to be able to get that sort of true view into um, your strengths and your weaknesses across the institution. But if you're looking for quick wins, I wouldn't start by looking at the comments on any of those particular accounts. I would search the institution's name on Reddit or on TikTok or on YouTube and see what questions people are posting as well as what sort of like day in the life videos your influencers or want to be influencers are, are posting out there because that is what people are finding when they're searching. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a huge footprint and you can't just pull together that footprint with masking tape and 10% of somebody's job. <laughs> Uh, giving a, a, a day an opportunity if she had uh, something to add. If not, Lexi, uh, we can go to um, one of the questions that uh, is in the chat. Great. So I'm going to start with Rachel's question. They ask, if we were to go with a more organic approach to admissions, how can institutions ensure that students will be successful if they're not using any sort of metrics? Hmm. <clears throat> Fantastic question. Um, so I'm first going to do a kind of snarky re reply question, which is, well, how do you know the ones we're using now do? <laughs> um, but then I'm going to actually answer it. Um, the, the metrics we what we have we're using now, which is like grades, right? Grades and involvement and extracurricular stuff like that. That worked, right? Um, but then most people know it works, and most people kind of know what the college formula is and, and what activities you need to get into. So um, it isn't that grades are meaningful. It is that the, sig the quality of the signal has diminished because we now know how to game it. And so what happens that folks with more, um, more affluent families, I'll, I'll say it that way, that have access to more resources, they train specifically for these signals. So grades, tests, activities, and so equally capable students that don't have access to that are being left out. Now, we all, like, this is not, this is, I think, common knowledge amongst the folks that work in this, right? What do you do about it? Well, I, I don't know. Like, this is a dream for me more than anything. And like, I, I, I want us to think about, okay, what are some of the qualities, um, like personality qualities that we can see in the student's background to date that you know show resilience, commitment, grit, time management that are not that are actually the things that you need, right, to succeed in university. And not necessarily great that we know can somewhat, not completely, but can somewhat be faked. Um, so I, I, I love, I was a straight A student, I'm grade obsessed, I love grades. But I think it's leaving a lot of people out. And I think that um, there are other ways that we can measure, can this person be successful? Does this person have potential? Which is what admissions was supposed to be, but now it's turned into this performance. And so one of my dreams is to do some sort of pilot project with an institution that's ready for it. That's like, you know what? We're just gonna, you know, it's this idea of open admissions, but you know, you can't, you can't go fully there if you're in an institution that doesn't do that. But maybe you work with four of your partner schools and say, you know, whoever applies, they're gonna get in from this school because we know the students from this school have been successful historically at this school, at this university, and then we're gonna see. And, and you kind of learn from that. It's what we did at first with the model that we're using now, but no one's being brave enough to change it now, right? And it's being gained. So that's that's one thing. The other thing I'll say is you can't just admit them and let them be, right? Like the, the resources have to be in place. Um, cohort models are super successful. Like students kind of being in the same class together and, and forming a community is super successful for retention and success. 
Uh, so the support systems have to be in place if you want to try something like this a little bit more organic and not traditional. I just want to, I threw it in the chat, but echoing what you started with day is like, don't assume we're starting from a place where everything works right now. Yeah. Because we are not perfect at admitting students who are going to make it all the way to graduation. Um, and we're also really quick to blame the student when that doesn't happen versus re-examining the structures and the, the, the target audience of who those structures were built to serve in the first place. I, I am really excited, equally terrified, but also excited about the next 10 to 20 years of higher education because I think many institutions have to reinvent. We can't just optimize what has been working or appears to be working for us in the past. We have to think differently, admit differently, recruit differently, and, and hold up the institutional end of the bargain differently. And there will be some institutions that are willing to try. There will be things that fail, but um, tr just trying to figure out like what's the littlest bit I can veer from what has been expected of me in order of this to work is probably not the best way to approach any sort of thing getting close to radical change. And, and radical change is what a lot of these students need for us to serve them well. I love seeing an obstacle as opportunity, the positivity of that. You don't hear a lot of people say they're super excited about the next 20 years. Of higher education. <laughs> but I mean, if you want to solve problems and you want to help students, then get excited because there's going to be opportunities um, to, to do just that. Um, so Lexi, I believe we have another question. Yeah, so we had a question from Mary um, for some specific examples around simple language. And I see, Day, you replied, but would you mind sharing um, live as well so those people watching yeah. the recording um, can also hear your great advice there? Um, so I believe the question was, how do you write simply or how do you know you're writing simply? Um, one of my favorite um, ways to write simply is to use spoken language. So the way that we speak is a lot simpler than the way that we write. Like we all have a writing persona. You can you can try it, right? And then try to read something you wrote and it's gonna sound super robotic and, and formal. Um, why is spoken language important? It's the first way we learn how to communicate when we're babies, right? We first, most people, um, most able-bodied people, like they first learn to speak sp the spoken word. You hear it, you practice it. And then you learn how to speak or write. And when you learn how to write, all these rules come into play, like, oh, grammar and this and spelling and things, and it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, the level, your level of literacy varies with your level of education, right? So some people go to super high levels of literacy, the more they study, the more they read, the more they write, the more they practice. But some folks don't, right? They stay kind of at that base uh, spoken language level, which works just fine for the rest of their lives, right? Um, it's the lowest common denominator, spoken language. We all get it, no matter what our level of literacy is. So it's an equalizer, right? And uh, so I, I always do that first. Like if I'm struggling to write, I say it. Like I say it as if I would explain it to someone and across my desk. And then I write it that way. Um, a good actual check is using a readability score or like read it, reading level um, score. And, uh, you know, most really great websites that we all use all the time and, and the websites that are written to get us to do things like buy are, are written at, a, at like a six to eight grade reading level. Mm -hmm. um, and what that has shown, and this is Nielsen Norman Group again, that if you write this way, then the cognitive load is reduced and whatever the task is at hand, that the people you know, trying to do it are much more likely to do it and to do it faster. So one of the things I love to do for fun is grab university pages and like drop them in a readability score. And most of the time it's like grade 12, postgraduate, like we're talking about the process to apply for a scholarship is written at a post like baccalaureate level. Who is gonna understand that? Who's gonna understand that? So um, that's, those are the two things I would recommend. Like first, try to write like you speak, try to explain things the way you would if somebody was across your desk. And uh, second, check yourself with one of these pages. I like Hemingway app, which is free. Um, and Grammarly, 
also does this. Um, there's a free version. And then if you pay, it gives you suggestions, which is kind of nice. Um, but again, these tools are totally accessible to us. They are super fun at parties. When you start open up college websites and throw in their text into readability, oh. you know, it's about to get crazy. Uh, it's going to uh, get fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it, you've said it before in um, um, some of your content, that wall of text. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be language. It's how it's presented, too. Um, mm -hmm. And this is for websites. This is for anything. Break it down. Use subheads. You know, make my eyes not tired when I get to your content. Um, there's mm -hmm. no attention span anymore for anyone. So um, you have to make content um, and messages uh, digestible as well. Um, do we have time for more questions? I don't even know what time this is. This Maybe is going if we great. give folks one more opportunity. Okay, Lexi, do we have any another question? That's if anyone has questions. Yeah, we don't have any other questions in the chat, um, but could follow up with some discussions that are going on based on the questions that have been answered. Um, Mary at com a community college, she does the same thing um, with an alliance called SI. H E A. I love that about our community. When you just share, just share in the community chat. You know, people have been here before. We're always encouraging that. So, mm -hmm. um, if something's working at your institution, um, share with your friends in the chat as well. So, um, thank yeah. you for doing that, Mary. I appreciate Mary, it. Mary was using the readability scanner as well for the web and all pu publications. So she's happy to know that she's on the right path. I'm excited because I have a new party game um, for my next party, just going through institutions games. <laughs> um, Sarah asked, um, she missed some of the resources that are available to analyze reading level in communications. I believe that was Grammarly in the Hemingway app. Yep. yep. Awesome. So well, let's get to takeaways, Mike. Yes. Someone coming to this um, uh, discussion um wanted some information uh they read the title they read the synopsis they read about our great guests and they're like i want to learn something so let's yeah. talk about takeaways so, Dave, why don't we have you start with your takeaways you'd want uh okay so basically uh barriers the, the thing if, if you remember anything from today is that there are more barriers than financial aid and the barriers that are there are things we can fix with our marketing communication skill set um, so language is one of them and uh, equity, um, digital, a digital equity divide. So access to internet devices, et cetera. So we can create content that is not highly, you know, taxing on an internet connection. We can send a simple email that's not designed. We can write simply. Those are big game changers for families, especially. That's one. Um, the other one, I think, is, is this idea of peer to peer and how powerful that is for recruitment um, and letting prospective students talk to current students and using social media as a platform for that to happen. Uh, one final thing, because I know this topic was about families. Um, I'll say families, um, they want to know more information now more than ever. Like Gen Z is very close to their family. A lot of that could be because the students spent the majority of high school at home with them. They're very involved. It's a little bit different than, than helicopter parenting. Um, it, it's truly a, a very tight kind of consultative relationship the way I'm seeing it. So uh, there was a recent study, um, I believe it was RNL, about communicating with parents that everybody should go look at because it's really insightful. And what they say is uh, families want to know everything. Like they want to know every, every topic is important. Like every topic is ranked 90% important. Um, but the difference between, there's a difference today versus two years ago about how frequently they want to hear from us. And I think it's something like 75% of families want to hear from us every week now. Like there's, there's a lot that they expect. And the other cool thing, um, I guess it's not cool, it sucks, is <laughs> that families, uh, families from uh, diverse backgrounds even though they have technically access to the same information, they report not being not having that access because access is not just, is it on the website? Mm -hmm. It is, can I read it? Do I understand it? So it goes back to my language barrier and access barrier. So we have a lot more control than we think, especially as it relates to equity. And that I think is the biggest takeaway for me. 
Dr. Gross, do you have any takeaways other than the one that I prepared? <laughs> for you? Uh, I appreciate you teeing that up for me. Um, really quickly, listen to your students' prospects and your future prospects. Uh, you can do that through data analysis, through social listening, through market research. Make sure you have a multi-pronged listening strategy. Um, we have hinted at this, but I don't know that we'd come out and said it in this conversation, but design these processes and experiences that center today's prospective student demographic and already thinking about tomorrow's, mm. not what you would have wanted 10 to 30 years ago. It's not about fixing what you would have wanted. It's providing what the students need today. Um, and then we've, uh, we've talked about this, but I'll summarize it. Make For those of you in leadership positions, please make time and space to seriously consider your recruitment strategy and admissions processes through the lens of your institution's strategic goals and who your audience is today, rather than just like updating last year's plan. We There's room for rethinking an awful lot of things. Awesome. Um, find the newsletter. I believe we're going to have Lexi put um, contact information in our chat. If you want to um, reach out today or um, Liz, and uh, just, just absorb all of their um, uh, great expert analysis as we want to connect you with them. Um, thank you, Lexi. Um, put it in the chat, um, but definitely um, get a hold of some of the content because it's really great. We only in an hour. There's so many right. things that oh, we've covered. We could have covered so much. Mike, would have, yeah, you, Mike would probably do a six-hour yes. um, series on this. So. It'll be like Lord of the Rings. But for... <laughs> That's right. Now yeah. we'll have to go to the, the prequels nice. exactly. of uh, uh, guiding uh, students and parents it's through hilarious. the process. So, um, uh, Dr. Gross Day, thank you both so much. Much, uh, for joining us on this conversation. Really great stuff. I can't thank you enough for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Awesome. Mike, you did great. You so did you. C yeah. plus. That's what I aim for. That's right. Absolutely. So, but it's not always about grades, isn't that That's right? That's right. Uh, thank you, Lexi. It's not. Potential. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lexi, um, for your help pro producing as always. Thank you to everyone who sent in the swag. Yes. There's more room on this wall and in Lexi's wall. Send it in. Um, Get a hold of us. We'll oh, send you some we cool got a stuff mongoose back. Mongoose teacup there. Oh, mongoose teacup. See, see? Betty, nice, yeah. lovely. The kids love the um the espressos. The tea, yes. Yeah, that, and that mongoose gives it a little extra uh, five percent caffeine jolt. Oh, good. Um, that's a uh, little, but uh, and some of these books we have read. Yes. Um. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We love our FYI community, of course. Brought to you by Mongoose Makers of Cadence Higher Ed's uh, premier engagement platform. Like, yes. make every message count.